Our story begins with a woman walking along an empty street at nightfall. She passes a bulletin board showing many missing women. Once she passes a man, he starts following her. Walking through an alley after her, he yells out that she dropped some cash. She says she did not, but he insists she did. The stranger soon runs up to her and grabs her, making her scream for him to let go. Lucky for the helpless woman, there is another one there to save her. She takes the stranger off, allowing the woman she saved to run away. We don't get to see what she does to the criminal. The scene changes to an elderly man waking up. He is Godfrey, who soon sits at his table, talking into a recorder. He says that 12 people have gone missing in the last two months. Half of them have now been dismembered. He disappointingly adds that he's no closer to solving this case. Then he arrives for work at a police station, where he works as a detective. He carries a tray of coffee with him, giving one of the cups to a man behind bars. Shortly after, he goes to sit in his car, writing something in his notebook. The words he writes show he thinks someone is an evil person. Godfrey hears someone whistling after that. He sees the whistling man walking by his car while holding a gym bag. It causes the detective to step outside, to take photos of that man from a distance. However, he's not the only one interested in him. A bum also sees him walk by, which makes him awaken a woman named Lacey. When she wakes up, we notice it's the woman from earlier. Hearing what he told her, she starts walking with a determined mindset. Godfrey sees her walk to the same door that the man opened. She rips off the door handle, which supposedly kept the door locked. At that moment, Godfrey and Lacey see each other. Following this, she enters the mysterious building. The next scene has a man pointing a gun at a dog. Once he pulls the trigger, it doesn't fire. He is relieved. Another man is there, who films this event. He wants the man with the gun, who he calls Tommy, to point the weapon at himself. Tommy hesitates to do it, prompting the cameraman to say that it's either Tommy who does it, or him. Pointing the gun at himself, he pulls the trigger, and remains alive. But this activity is not just being recorded, it's being streamed live. Since Tommy didn't lose his life, the cameraman gets excited, due to how lucky he is. Afterward, Tommy points the gun at the dog again, supposedly. There is a lot of money to be gained doing this, yet he struggles to shoot the innocent animal, despite the respectable amount of cash at stake. At that point, Lacey enters, to move his hand away. He manages to shoot her in the head. Surprisingly, the shot is not lethal. She puts her fingers in his eyes to bring him down. This spontaneous wild happening is making the cameraman lose his mind, as he captures such exciting footage. He doesn't even care about the man who just lost his life. He points his gun at her in amazement before leaving. Lacey comes to the dog, to take the money around its neck. After setting it free, she takes out plant cutters to start severing Tommy's fingers. Meanwhile, the wicked cameraman traverses through the dark interior of the building. He bangs on a door, making a big man open it. He calls the cameraman Jerry and tells him he's working. The big man is Terrence, whose work involves him keeping a helpless man restrained to a chair. Jerry tries explaining his situation to him, because Terrence is his boss, but he finds it's better to just show him. Upon arriving at the scene of the bizarre event, they witness Tommy is now missing his fingers. After that, Lacey exits the building, with Godfrey being there to see her. He has a hard time trying to tell her she has an exit wound in her head. He can hardly believe what he sees. How casually she walks out makes it even more unbelievable. Godfrey then enters the place, equipped with his gun. In the meantime, Terence instructs Jerry to deliver the recorded footage. When Godfrey sees both of the criminals pass him by unnoticed, he cautiously enters the room they left. Outside, we see Lacey eating the fingers she severed off the man. She is a strange phenomenon. Not only does she survive an injury that would otherwise be fatal, but she also eats human parts. Adding to the strangeness, we observe someone appearing on the roof, only to disappear two seconds later. The next scene has Godfrey sitting at home, looking at the notes he has written. The most interesting one is that he witnessed a bullet through the head. He even has two question marks near it, because he's uncertain if what he saw was real. The detective is reasonable to question such an oddity. He also thinks there's no point in reporting it, because no one would believe him. Following this, we see more of the fascinating Lacey as she sits alone in a restaurant at night. She wants to eat oatmeal and nothing else. Afterward, we see a lady in white enter a room where Terence is sitting. She is Meredith, and he wants her to look at the new footage they acquired. He describes to her what's on it, though she doesn't believe his words. She only believes them when her eyes view the actual data on the screen. Amazed by it as much as he is, she demands to learn Lacey's name. Terence explains that he will tell her, once he learns it himself. Then they open a vehicle, that shows us they received more trafficked victim. We find out they are siblings, because they talk about calling their mother. In the next scene, Lacey comes to her friend to give him some of the money she collected. We see her wound is gone, it's like it was never there. On the following day, Godfrey comes to Lacey's friend, causing him to run away. The detective just wants to talk to him, but the bum won't have it. Seeing Lacey gets him a different negative reaction. She tells him to leave her alone. He is amazed to see her injury has vanished yet he doesn't say it in words. To get her attention, Godfrey has to mention Lacey taking people's fingers away. After that, they both sit at the restaurant Lacey seems to like. He finally mentions her head injury too, being amazed that it's no longer there. Lacey tells him she ended Tommy because she wanted to eat parts of him. She also reveals she takes the fingers because they're easier to carry, plus she needs the bone marrow. Although she eats parts of people, there in the restaurant, she orders oatmeal again. 
or order surprises Godfrey. She also tells him the one she destroyed was not her first choice. She had planned to get the man with rings, as she describes him. Godfrey seems to know who she's referring to. It's Terence. Lacey witnessed how he captured a woman, in addition to placing her in a van. Since they are interested in the same person, the detective proposes they make a trade. He wants to give her a refrigerator, because Lacey wants one. However, we don't get to hear what the man wants from her. We then see Terence with Meredith. He says that even after digging, he can't find anything about Lacey. So they start talking about what they want to do about this. Terence says he wants Lacey to participate in certain activities, if they catch her, or they could ship her away to whoever pays the most money for the extraordinary lady. His sister replies that she will think about it. Afterward, Godfrey takes Lacey into a room that belongs to him. It's very untidy, but it's much better than living outside. The first thing Lacey goes to look at is the refrigerator. To her, it's the most interesting appliance there. As the detective is trying to hand her a yellow envelope, she is occupied with looking at everything. There are photos inside, he says. Photos of Terence, along with a man named Paul. Godfrey makes it clear that he wants Paul to disappear. Even though he's a lawman, he has no qualms about Lacey ending him. He doesn't even care if she eats him. Later, Lacey stands inside a hallway, where she notices the strange man again as he appears and disappears. Following this, a man opens the door. Lacey holds his photo next to him to see if they match. Since he wears glasses in the picture, she has to process whether it's him for a few extra seconds. Once she's mostly sure it's him, our heroine busts through the door to take his line. Jerry happens to be there too, who stabs her a few times with his knife. Unfortunately for the wicked man, his attacks don't work too well, so she beats him until he falls. After her easy victory, Lacey spots a young lady there, handcuffed to a bed. She tells Lacey to stay away from her, which makes her listen. Inside his office, Godfrey looks at his notebook. On the inside of the back cover, he looks at a photo of a young girl. We don't know who she is, though she could be his daughter. Soon his co-worker, Janice, enters his room, seemingly out of nowhere. He asks her if it takes time to realize that one has done the worst thing in their life. Or does one realize it instantly? To his concern, Janice just recommends that he sleeps. We wonder what prompted the detective to ask that. He also asked it after looking at the young girl's photo. Past midnight, Lacey calls Godfrey to inform him she did what he wanted her to do. She also mentions the young lady that she just left alone there. Of course, Godfrey considers it strange behavior that Lacey would walk away from a victim. He says Lacey should go back to stay with the girl. Since this is what he wants, she returns to the apartment to break the girl's handcuffs with her hands. Whoever Lacey is, she is a powerhouse. She tells the girl that she can go. Outside, the lady stands beside Lacey as the latter uses a payphone to talk to someone. Afterward, Lacey presents two options to the girl. She could either not tell anyone about what happened to her, or she can call Godfrey on the number Lacey gives her. Then she leaves for the third time. The next scene has Terence trying to call his associate. Since they are not answering, Meredith advises him to go to their apartment. It's not even far away. Switching back to Lacey, she sits inside her favorite restaurant. The girl soon joins her. She is Susie, who won't leave her alone. She starts guessing Lacey's nature, yet Lacey denies all the guesses thrown her way. The girl becomes shocked to learn her rescuer eats people. It doesn't take long for Lacey to tell the girl she doesn't like her. She also shows her the stab wound she received, and Susie is further amazed by her healing power. Throughout the entire time sitting there, Lacey holds an expressionless demeanor like she always does. Later, we see Godfrey entering the apartment where his new friend caused all the trouble. He has to cover his nose with a towel. Opening containers shows him dismembered body parts. Shortly after, Terence enters, making them see each other. Godfrey orders the man to stay where he is, but the criminal charges at him. Then we see Lacey walking with Susie. The girl continues to express amazement toward the wonder she encountered. Yet Lacey keeps acting emotionless, lying to Susie that everything is normal. When they occupy a laundromat, Lacey asks her if she finds the cuts on her arms to be helpful. She doesn't regret creating them, though they're not all from her. At that point, Lacey tells her she has scars that will never heal. Soon the duo arrive at the place that Godfrey gifted to Lacey. The first thing she does is pack her freezer with fresh meat. Susie, on the other hand, closes herself in the washroom. In there, she practices saying several different statements she wants to say to her new companion. All of them suggest she wants to be her friend. Meanwhile, Lacey stares at the closed washroom door, perhaps wondering what this new girl is doing in there. Eventually, Susie exits the room to state her chosen choice of words, what is Lacey doing tonight? However, her savior responds very disappointingly by telling Susie she should leave. Alone in the washroom now, Lacey stands shirtless to show us two scars on her back. They seem to indicate that wings used to be there. Leaving the room, she sees that Susie never left. She's sleeping on her couch. This prompts Lacey to sit in a chair to watch her. After that, we get to witness what happened to Godfrey. He sits restrained in a chair. Meredith comes to tend to the detective, applying some ice to him. They start talking casually, like they're not in this unfortunate situation. Soon enough, she asks if he knows who she is. The man only knows her brother. He has reason to believe that he's part of a human f***ing ring. Meredith knows that he's trying to chase Terence down of his own accord, because there is no record of her brother in the police department. She knows this because 34% of their annual revenue goes to law enforcement. By hearing this, 
We learn how corrupt the system is. Meredith asks if Godfrey is doing all this because of his daughter, Chelsea, who went missing in the year 2000. But they're not the ones who took her. Meredith couldn't find the girl after searching their records. Godfrey's answer surprises her. He says he has known for years now where Chelsea resides. According to him, she is with her family. It's only his sense of guilt that's keeping them apart. The final statement he gives her is he doesn't need a reason to want people like them to get destroyed. With those parting words to Meredith, she gets replaced by her brother. He slides a photo of Lacey to the detective, wanting Godfrey to tell him everything he knows about her. He also starts taking all the rings off his fingers. Afterward, Lacey comes to Susie as the latter sleeps. She grabs her by the neck and it looks like she wants to eat her. Thankfully, she doesn't go through with it. She just leaves. Stepping outside, Terence is there to call out to her. It looks like he managed to squeeze out the information he wanted from Godfrey. He says she's been looking for him. He's been looking for her too. Once she starts walking his way, he rushes to collect a baseball bat from his car. Striking her with it doesn't bring her down. She even insults him, taunting him to do it again. So he gives her what she wants. At that moment, she asks if this is a kidnapping. After him saying it is, she asks if she can just go with them. We wonder why she's okay with doing that. Terence agrees to it, yet he wants to strike her again. The third strike is hard enough to knock her down. Susie witnesses this barbarism, which makes her lose her calm. The next scene has her entering the police station to ask for Godfrey. Her asking causes a man to come to her, saying that the detective no longer works there. Upon his leaving, Susie tells Janice she doesn't even know why she's looking for Godfrey. She just knows he's important because Lacey mentioned him. Wanting to help her, Janice secretly instructs Susie to enter Godfrey's office, where they will soon meet. Since Janice can't reach him either, she wants Susie to be frank with her as to why she's looking for the man. Susie starts by saying she's looking for somebody else. Following this, we see Lacey in heavy chain restraints in one of Terence's rooms. Meredith comes over to look at their spectacular victim. While touching Lacey, Meredith gets startled by her sudden reaction. Terence shares some interesting news with his sister by saying Lacey weighs 247 pounds, about twice as much as she looks. Lacey tells them to leave her there, adding that she will lose something. Terence asks her what she means, but she does not answer. Before Meredith leaves, she advises her brother not to overindulge. Susie is then shown a photo of Terence, making her confirm it's him. She also points at a picture of Paul, saying she used to do work for him. When Janice asks her what kind of work it was, Susie does not feel comfortable answering her. Back in the building of horrors, Terence comes to Lacey to ask her what she's looking at, because she stares off to the side. Sometimes she can see someone that no one else does, is what she tells her captor. After telling her it sounds like she's schizophrenic, the evil man starts pushing a knife into her chest. Not only does she stay alive, she remains conscious too. She is something entirely new to him. In the next scene, Susie comes to Lacey's friend. His first words to her are that she should stay away from Lacey's belonging. He also tells her that Lacey went into the building near them with Terence, though he calls Terence, the man with the rings. This makes the girl knock on the metal door, which summons a man wielding a knife to open it. After presenting enough information to him, he lets her inside. In there, he checks her for weapons. While he does, Susie stealthily takes the keycard he carries. Keeping with her stealthy behavior, she starts making her way through the building. Meanwhile, we see Meredith at a party. Susie uses her acquired keycard to open a door. That allows her to join the boss lady at the party. It seems like it's taking place right there in the building. She sees Meredith, and Meredith sees her. Fortunately, Susie is not recognized as a threat. Soon enough, she leaves the party. Not long after that, she spots Godfrey in a room by himself. She also opens a door to witness what she came for. She observes her new friend in heavy chain restraints, being t***ed by Terence. It makes her return to Godfrey's room to tell him she is Lacey's friend. Susie adds the bad news that he's fired. With all the misfortunes he has experienced, the man is still capable of reacting with negative surprise. This is strange, because he could have easily lost his life in this building. Plus he could have lost it horribly. After Susie frees him, they start walking together. Back in the room that contains the most powerful lady, Terence steps back to look at all the knives he stabbed into her. Interrupting his indulgence, Susie opens the door again to scream for Lacey. Then she runs, prompting Terence to come out for her. The man informs her that it's rude to interrupt people while they work. At that moment, Godfrey starts strangling Terence with chains from behind. This is also the time when our heroine starts struggling to free herself from the chain. The man who was left in the room begins getting filled with worry. Yet his boss can't help him due to his own problem. Lacey frees her arms and removes some of the knives inside her. Freeing herself entirely, she flies forward and attacks him to take his life off screen. Shortly after, Terence's head rolls into the party for Meredith to see. It makes for quite the party gift. She sees the one who rolled it in, Lacey. Lacey enters the party, delivering a wild scream for everyone to be alarmed. People start coming at her, but she handles them without a problem. The powerful lady causes havoc at the party. This is certainly a celebration no one will forget. Lacey even rips someone's heart out, giving Meredith more reason to fear her. Following this, Lacey confronts the boss on the rooftop. There they engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Meredith displays surprisingly great fighting skills. She gives our catastrophic heroine a run for her money. However, 
There was never any doubt about who the victor would be as Lacey throws the wicked woman off the roof. Shortly after, Susie comes to her, along with Godfrey. After asking her friend if she's okay, Susie hugs her. In the next scene, Lacey sits in the laundromat. Godfrey enters, to tell her the clothes she's watching are his. He also says it's time for him to travel, so he can visit his daughter. What interests the former detective is how Lacey is doing with her food. She is stocked, thanks to her refrigerator. Once he tells her she burned through his list, we see Lacey smile for the first time. For some reason, she says her heart bleeds. As the man is leaving, she stands to tell him her real name, which is Lilith. When he leaves, she hears voices that one would call demonic. At that point, we finally see the man who disappears, standing near her. He holds a cane and wears a top hat, hearing Lacey tell him that she doesn't know what he wants from her, or if he even exists. While she continues to speak her mind to him, we see Godfrey entering his flat to find a man sitting at his desk. He asks this mysterious stranger how he got in there. The man tells him they have to chat about something. Not taking any chances, Godfrey fires a bullet into the man's head. The scene then shifts, to show us that Susie is working as a waiter at Lacey's favorite restaurant. The girl has settled into a life that doesn't involve crime. The man who Godfrey shot removes the bullet from his head, letting us know that Lacey isn't the only wonder in this world. He tells the man who shot him that the apocalypse is coming. Furthermore, he wants Godfrey's help finding someone. Afterward, Lacey tells her mystery man that she's sorry for what she did long ago. She once had a son, who she cannot remember. We are forced to wonder what happened to him. The last thing she asks of this stranger is when will he be done with her. If he gave her an answer, which he likely didn't, we do not get to hear it. The final moment has Lacey returning to her home, where she sees a dog at the doorstep. She expresses worry, seeing it there, but she sits near it anyway. She smiles for the second time as she pets it, before letting the animal inside her home to give it food. In the meantime, we see several motorcycles parked nearby. We never did get to learn who Lacey is, or Lilith, as she called herself at the end. All we know is that certain forces have taken her that she doesn't understand herself.